commentator didn't believe that anything happened in John chapter 20 when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He said that was anticipatory. What? Aren't you paying attention? This, is, this, this all fits when you understand the purpose and the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2 the flags to empower, are back up. not to regenerate. They're already born again. They were born again resurrection night when Jesus breathed on them. But they needed to be empowered, and so do you and I. And we're going to talk about that when we get into Acts chapter 1 and 2. We're going, to, we're going to talk a lot about the Holy Spirit, in fact, because I don't know if you're aware of how many times the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the book of Acts, far more than any other book. And so we're going to talk a Except lot about the Holy Spirit. Room. We're going to talk about a lot about the power of the Holy Spirit and why that power is necessary. But we're not going to diminish what happens here and in John chapter 20. Flag, we're not going to moment. gloss over it. We're going to realize this is... <clears throat> so far, this side here isn't back up. they were born again. And by the way, when you receive the Holy Spirit for empowering, it's not like you received more of the Holy Spirit or like you had less of the Holy Spirit before. You can't think of the Holy Spirit that way. It, 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 the Holy Spirit comes into our lives for different reasons. There are different purposes connected to his work in our lives. And when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, the first and primary work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to regenerate, okay? That you might be born again. But he longs also to do a work in each of us that we might be spiritually equipped and empowered to do the work that he's called us to do in this world. Look at that. Right? So. Split right down the middle. There you go. Now, as we uh, finish through this chapter, we're going to deal with an issue here uh, of unbelief related to the person of Thomas. Verse 24, it says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, who was called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came, meaning the first time. We don't know why. Apparently he didn't get the memo that they had a meeting that night. So verse 25 says, so the other disciples told him, and of course they did. They said, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, and I want you to hear what Thomas says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. By the way, in the Greek, that's emphatic. All right. And you know, I look at the words of Thomas here and I think to myself, I can probably relate a little bit from the standpoint that, you know, the death of Jesus was so traumatic. It was so overwhelming in terms of its reality and the, the difficulty of it, that those kinds of things don't fade very easily just because somebody waltzes around into your life and goes, oh, by the way, he's alive again. I want Bono to he come He came here out of the sing. tomb. He's doing great. We saw him. We talked with him. And give Robin right. a shout out. I mean, the, the mind just doesn't want to go there, you know? And you'll notice that Thomas gives conditions for believing. He says, unless I see and unless I feel. So he's putting that 
above everything else, unless I see and unless I feel, I will not, I will never believe. You know, we call Thomas a doubting Thomas, if you've heard that term before. He's kind of a doubting Thomas. It comes right from this passage. But you know what? This really isn't doubt. This is unbelief. Okay? Doubt is kind of like, oh, I'm not really sure. That's not what Thomas is saying here. He's saying, uh, no. Unless I see and, and feel, I will never believe. This is, this is a stubborn refusal to accept and believe. That's what's going on here. So this is way more than just doubt, okay? And by the way, doubt is something that every believer deals with at certain and different times in their Christian life. So if you've struggled, you know, with your own aspect of doubt from time to time, don't beat yourself up and feel like, you know, you're the worst Christian ever known to mankind because it does happen. But that's not what's going on here. This is unbelief, and you're going to see that Jesus refers to it as what it is here in just a bit as well. But, you know, whatever issues uh, that Thomas dealt with related to unbelief and doubt, he was not alone. You guys do know that, right? Thomas, we, we kind of put Thomas in this category over here, you know, the guy who had a hard time coming to terms with the reality of faith, but he was not the only one. Let me show you a passage from Matthew 28 once again. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, uh, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. But look at this, but some doubted. You, you kind of look at that, you might kind of go, Why did Matthew tell us that? Well, because it happened. And because it, it, doubt is a real thing from time to time, it's a real thing. And honestly, I'm glad Matthew threw a comment like that in because that's reality. You know, if I if somebody was writing the Bible to just to just draw you into a fallacy or whatever, they wouldn't say things like "and some doubted," because that that could possibly put a seed of doubt in your mind. Well, if some of the guys who were right there doubted. Wow, maybe I'm justified in my doubt or something like that, you know. But isn't it interesting that the, the biblical writers didn't have any problem telling you the absolute truth that some of the people struggled to come to faith and to really, truly trust that this was all real and legit. I, I don't know about you. I like that. I do. It injects the, the, the truth of, of what's really kind of going on. Because you guys, faith is not a perfect thing. I've walked with the Lord long enough, and I'm sure many of you have too. You realize faith is not a perfect thing. It is a very imperfect thing. And we will categorize faith in some places. Have you ever noticed that? People sometimes think of, well, I'm, I'm having a hard time with my faith, or my faith is strong. I don't know about you, but my faith is very scattered. It, it, it's, it's almost kind of like it's schizo. Seriously, I'll have faith, and I've talked to other people that are like this too. They, if I say to them, do you believe that, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that you're going to have, oh, absolutely, 100%. No problem. I mean, there's just no doubt in their mind. I am a born again Christian child of God, no doubt. I've never even questioned it for a second. Do you think God's going to take care of your daily needs? I doubt it. I've heard it. I have heard it. And it is, a, it is a reality. You know, I believe that Jesus died on the cross and will save me, but I have absolutely zero faith that he can restore my marriage. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me, and I'm going to heaven, and I know that, but I have absolutely no faith that he can heal my body. You see, we can, we can compartmentalize our faith. We can have very strong faith in one area and extremely weak faith in another. And that, so faith is not a perfect thing. It is a very imperfect, very challenging sort of a thing. And we're all, hopefully, growing in our faith, but we are growing sometimes in different areas, different compartments, you know? 
So just understand that. Well, anyway, here's what happens with this whole struggle. It says eight days later, his disciples were again, or inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said that important phrase, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, I didn't, and don't you love this? He just, he goes right to Thomas. And he says, put your finger here and, and see my hands, look at my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. And I want you to see what Jesus says to Thomas. Do not disbelieve, right? That's actually a good translation. Do not disbelieve. That's and, and see my hands. Look at my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. And I want you to see what Jesus says to Thomas. Do not disbelieve. Right? That's actually a good translation. Do not disbelieve. That's unbelief. Do not disbelieve, but believe. The, the, the New King James says, do not be unbelieving. And that's actually good too. And Thomas responds here in verse 28 by saying, my Lord and my God. And yes, that is a declaration of his deity, the deity of Jesus. No question about it. But what Jesus goes on to tell Thomas is something we all need to hear. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's an important thing for all of us to really take hold of. You've probably heard the, the statement, seeing is believing. Well, Jesus pronounces a blessing, a blessing on those who have not seen and yet believe. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, now wait just a minute here, Paul. <clears throat> isn't, isn't that the definition of blind faith? Believing without seeing? A flag? No, it's not. And here's the reason why. When we put our faith... No Israel. In the finished no, work of no Jesus Prince Christ of Wales. on the cross for our sins, we are putting our faith in so much more than what you can see with your eyes. So much more. No Venezuela. That's one of the reasons Paul says what he says in Romans chapter 10. Let me show you. You know this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... No and glory. believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Lovely verse. You're but guess what? There to see the empty tomb, were you? You, you're... No, no, we were a couple gay. thousand years too late. Your gaze we not there. We didn't get to walk by the tomb and see the, the, the stone rolled away. We didn't get to peer inside and see the grave clothes lying to one side. We didn't get to even be there when Jesus showed up that evening in a locked room with the door closed and, and suddenly was among them. We didn't get to talk to angels. No united kingdom. And yet we believe that God raised him from the dead, just as Paul said. No you united with your mouth, Arab Jesus is Lord, Emirates, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Emirates. You will be saved. Yet we believe. And the reason that I believe is because I trust the eyewitness testimonies that are given to us in the Bible. I've studied them for a lot of years, and I trust them. And I trust <clears throat> the Bible. I trust that the Bible is God's word. And because no, Ukraine. I believe God came and did something further in my life that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8. Let me show you. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. No turkey. You'll notice that it doesn't say there that God's spirit bears witness with our spirit that we can be children of God. This is not a witness that comes to us before faith. <laughs> this is the weird part about it. Once you put your faith 
in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, then the Spirit comes and bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. And it's a beautiful thing. And the chapter then concludes with John saying in verse 30, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. He, he clearly is, is telling us that there was way more that happened that is not written down. But he said, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So you see, John was cognizantly aware of the fact that his eyewitness no, testimony was going to have an impact on people. And that's why he wrote and this down. Tobago. And that's the Tobago. beauty of you Tobago. and me being able to read these passages in the Bible and study them out and look at the integrity and the honesty and the sincerity with which they're written. And we can say to ourselves, you know, I believe this. I believe Q2. this. You know, there are lots of other things. Thailand's here. There's lots of other reasons that we Q2. put our faith in, in, in the Lord. And, you know, there, there's elements of the Bible. Man, I, I get this question Valeris. all the time, you know. Like, how do I know the Bible is true? And how do I know that I can trust in the veracity and and uh, legitimacy of the biblical text and so forth? And uh, we, I did a study on that, actually, uh, a number of years ago. You'll find it on our YouTube channel. Um, they're called Truth Topics. In fact, you can find it on our website, too. Um, and and I, I go through an entire study on how you can know, why you can know, how you can know that the Bible is reliable. And I would Three, encourage you to get on our website, ccontario.com, and just check that out. Is that Ezekiel 38? Under um, 38? topical series. And, um, Psalms 83. You know, there's some, Psalms there's some important information there that goes through a lot. I don't have time to go through it all Ezekiel this morning, but 38. there's a lot of reasons, you guys. In fact, it is unreasonable to reject the truth of the Bible. My final answer. Unreasonable. My final answer. Psalms 83, Ezekiel 38, 888, 38, Q1, Belarus, Prince of the Bail ARS, 17th and JFK, Christmas Day. 555 to 848 2023 third floor smoke rises up just like it's on the back of a 50 dollar bill my final answer unless that day comes and goes and nothing happens then i'll have another final answer after that but uh all these flags are new so I mean, maybe they just didn't get to Israel just yet. But I did say it would be pretty unusual if all the flags were up except for Israel. Or all the flags were down except for Israel. But they definitely put all new flags up. When you really look at all of the reasons for faith, it is unreasonable <clears throat> to reject it in the end. And in the end, the reason people reject it isn't because of a lack of evidence. Who lives here? It's just, they just don't want to believe it. <laughs> it's that same stubborn refusal, you know, like, like we saw in Thomas that said, you know, I'm gonna, here's my conditions for, for me believing and so forth. But anyway, so. Wow, one more chapter left in uh, John. So let's go ahead and stand. We'll close in prayer. I like that. Stand you instead of bow your head and close your eyes. prayer this morning, we'll have some folks up front here that. that would love to pray with you. Lift up your needs to the Lord. Just agree in prayer. So, Father, we want to we wanna be people of faith. We want to be people of faith. Not doubt, but faith. But we know that our faith isn't perfect. And, and you're doing a work in every one of us to draw us closer and strengthen us in faith every day.
YouTube Premium is ad-free YouTube and background play. So you can watch videos while like reading, right. searching, shopping. Try one month free. Our faith isn't perfect, so Father, we wanna we wanna be people of faith. We wanna be people of faith, not doubt, but faith. But we know that our faith isn't perfect, and and you're doing a work in every one of us to draw us closer and strengthen us in faith every day. And I pray, Lord God, that we would just really cooperate with that work of your Spirit. To make us people of faith who stand, even when doubts arise, even when skepticism comes our way from others, that we would stand. Thank you, Lord, for the empty tomb and for all that it means for us. Because our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, rose from the grave. The promise of new life is given to us. And I pray, my Father God, for anybody here this morning who has not yet accepted that finished work of Jesus, that they would do it even now as I'm closing in prayer, and just in the quiet of their own heart, say, Jesus, I believe. I believe you died for me. I confess my sin. And I pray that you'd forgive me and come and live in my heart and change my life. Thank you, Father. Strengthen us to live for you each and every day. We ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name and all God's people said together, amen. God bless you.